with some really big news. Today, I'm joined by Ride Development CEO, Paul Jacob, Senate President Robert Stiver, SOAR Executive Director Colby Hall, Senator Johnny Turner, and Representative Adam Bowling to announce incredible news for Bell County and what is the largest investment in history in Eastern Kentucky. Today, we are announcing the Lewis Ridge Coal to Pump Storage Hydropower Project, which has now been approved for $81 million in federal grants to help construct a first of its kind $1.3 billion project that is a coal to pump storage hydropower facility in Bell County. We believe, again, this is the largest investment ever in Eastern Kentucky. The project will create about 1,500 high quality construction jobs, 30 operational jobs, and will deliver enough clean energy to power about 67,000 homes annually. The funding is through the U.S. Department of Energy's Clean Energy Demonstration Program and former Mine Land Grant, which was funded through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. The project was approved for ride development to transition a former coal mine site adjacent to the Cumberland River to a pump storage hydroelectric facility. Congratulations to ride development. And thank you to President Biden, Secretary Jennifer Granholm, Deputy Secretary David Turk, and the Department of Energy for supporting Kentucky as we continue to meet America's energy needs. We are so proud to support a $1.3 billion project that builds on the region's strong energy production history while creating 1,530 good jobs to help us power the next generation. Rye Development is committed to paying prevailing wages and offering plenty of apprenticeship opportunities, not just 1,530 jobs, 1,530 good jobs. They've been engaging with stakeholders since spring 2022, leading to 17 local letters of support and a partnership with Shaping Our Appalachian Region, one of Kentucky's six regional innovation hubs that represents 54 Appalachian Regional Commission counties to ensure that the benefits of this project are far reaching. While it will have an incredible impact on Bell County, it's going to have an amazing impact on all of Eastern Kentucky. Together, they're gonna prioritize local hiring through partnerships with several unions in the Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College by providing a registered apprenticeship program and other workforce training activities. These facilities are the most common form of energy storage in the United States, representing 93% of all utility scale storage, though I think, as you'll hear from their CEO, this would be the first time it's ever done quite this way. This project has the potential to produce up to eight hours of dispatchable power when needed, a vital tool during times of peak demand or extreme weather events, which we sadly know way too much about. We're so excited about this opportunity for Bell County and our great Kentucky workers. Now I'll turn it over to Rye CEO, Paul Jacob, and let's give him a big round of applause. He's investing $1.3 billion. Thank you, Governor Bashir. Thank you for the invitation to come today. We're honored to, to be receiving, to be selected for this grant from the DOE, but more than that, we're honored to be building this project and pursuing this project in Eastern Kentucky. This pursuing the grant itself has been a, a effort that's been taking close to a year and it's involved support and incredible support throughout the state and throughout the, the governor's administration. I specifically want to thank, um, I specifically want to thank the governor I want to thank the, the um, I'm sorry, I'm just checking my notes here, Secretary Goodman, Kenya Stump, Secretary Noel, and the team at Economic Development. Also, Senate President Stivers, Senator Turner and Representative Bowling, as well as Jonathan Smith and Coulter Minnix for their support. And also to the, the federal delegation, which has been very supportive as well. And I, I also want to echo the, the the support that we got from SOAR, from saving our Appalachian region and Colby Hall has been tremendous. As we move forward with this project, what we expect to do is to build the first of its kind pump storage project on mine lands. If you think of where this is being built, this is unlike any project that's been built around the world. This is a, an, a mountain that has on it five different coal seams and countless mines. We're building on the top of that mountain, a basically a 60 acre pool um, that itself is an engineering challenge, 
but the federal grant that we've received is going to help de-risk that and help us accelerate the project. We look forward to moving ahead with this with with as much haste as we can. It is a long-term project, and that's the the part of this. This is a commitment that's not just several years. This is a, a development process that'll take seven to 10 years, including the building and a project that will last likely for a century. Again, thank you very much. And we really appreciate the support. It's been integral to our success and to moving this project forward. Thank you. Governor, first of all, thank you, your administration, uh, a lot in the federal delegation for those individuals that supported the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill. It's paid some pretty good dividends for us, like the Brent Spence Bridge and others. Um, but I want to say to Senator Turner and Representative Bolin and that, you know, they brought me into this project. We governor's office reached out. We wrote letters of support to sit here and tell you that I actually know what this does. Probably don't not from a mechanical situation, but I can tell you what it does to the region. You know, we've talked about this and Colby and I, Colby and I've had these discussions, Rocky and I've had these discussions. This is something that is in Bell County, but for multiple counties, it will impact Knox County, Harlan County, Clay County, Whitley County, a lot of counties in and around the area. It will have a huge fiscal impact in that region, a region that if you knew the historical background, the sociological changes, you know, that was once a rich energy production area that had a population in that county of probably around 50,000 at one time that now has less than 30,000. This is an opportunity to restore hope. So to my colleagues, the governor's office, the individuals at Rye, and I specifically want to call out Colby and Soar because they have been preaching this regionalism and regional cooperation. And this is a perfect example how when people come together in a region, the impact that you can have, not on just a county, a city, but six, eight, 10, 12 counties, and have to say this, maybe even a little bit into Tennessee. <laughs> Don't like that, but it's reality. It is a regional transformational project. And so this is a good announcement and a good day for a region and for a state and for regional cooperation. So thanks to all who have been involved. Oh, thank you, Governor, for the opportunity to be here. And, and Senator Stivers, thank you for those kind words. And Senator Turner and Representative Bowling, all your help. Um, Horse racing, bourbon, and pump storage hydropower. We'll have to work on that a little bit, but uh, I think that uh, that's what's the exciting part about today is while we're announcing this this one point three billion dollar project, um, we've had numerous conversations this morning that there's more to come. There's more demand. Um, these projects take up just a little bit of space. They need elevation. They need water, and they need transmission lines. And we have a lot of those in Eastern Kentucky. So uh, we look forward. I, I want to give all the credit in the world to the Rye Development Team. They've been great partners in Eastern Kentucky. They've done this the right way. They've interacted with every community member that's had a question, a concern, whatever anybody needed about the project. They met. They 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 came to them. And so uh, over the next ten years, one you know one point three billion dollars, fifteen hundred construction jobs. Um, it's something that works really really well in Eastern Kentucky. And to me, it represents the spirit of Governor when when your your father, Steve Bashir and Congressman Rogers created SOAR. These are the types of projects and Senator Stivers that they had in mind. And so we were honored to play a small role in this, but it really took a village to bring it across. And, um, you know, the start of March Madness today, it's already a, a really exciting day in Kentucky. And this just adds even more to, to, to that. So lots more good work to come and it's an honor to be here and congratulations Paul again to, to you and your team for for this big award so thank you all I want to thank everybody behind me for the great job they've done for the public for the soar the whole group that's been mentioned to you it is the day because the mountains was uh, cold first and guess what hydro first now in eastern Kentucky what can we say? We're moving on. Thank everybody. It's an exciting day for us. You know, when, when you look at Bell County and our adjacent counties, the, the proud history they've had in energy production in our nation, 
um, you know, going back to the early 1900s, late 1800s, even in some cases. Uh, it's a proud history. And this project will allow us to continue on that history. And I'm excited about that. I'm really excited for our local community. Um, the, the impact this will have not only on jobs when, when this project is up and running, but on the 1500 construction jobs and what it will do for our tax base. We are talking about a $1.3 billion investment and that's going to help our schools. It's going to help our, our city governments, our county governments. Um, and it, it, it really is going to move us forward in a lot of different ways and a lot of different avenues. Um, I want to thank the, our federal delegation, Department of Energy, uh, Governor Bashir, Secretary Goodman. Um, they've been excellent to work on, not on just this project, but on multiple projects. And uh, we're, we're excited about it. And I know that this is a long process. This, this isn't the end of the road for this, for this project, but the beginning of a long, of a long process. And we're very excited about it. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. All right. Congratulations, gentlemen. Thank you all very much. This was uh, such an exciting announcement. I asked my mom to come. So thanks for being here. Uh, pretty thrilling. Pretty thrilling. Yesterday, being at uh, Goodwill in West Louisville and realizing over two and a half years, we'd announced about a thousand jobs in that area from Stellar Snacks to the hospital to Goodwill to MMY. And today, being able to announce 1,530 jobs in Eastern Kentucky, we have had a really good week here in the Commonwealth. And that's not all, because even before uh, today's announcement, over the last four years, we'd had over a thousand new location and expansion projects in Kentucky, totaling over $30.3 billion and creating more than 52,000 new jobs. And that's before today's announcement. Uh, but today we've got a few more pieces of good economic news to share. On Monday, we announced continued site development efforts with a build ready location in Adair County. The work that is happening at the Green River Commerce Park in Columbia uh, is a testament to Kentucky's commitment to site development. Uh, this is how we win the speed to market race to make sure uh, that we have the roads, the power, the infrastructure, and the water to where when people choose to locate here, we get them up and running faster than anyone. I got to be in E-Town uh, where Advanced uh, Nano Products looked at Secretary Janet Yellen and say they had their building uh, up and they were gonna operate months before anyone in their industry had ever heard of it being possible. That's what this type of investment, which is in both versions of the budget right now, it, it does need to be a little bit larger, uh, helps us do. So this is an important program, paving the way for more companies to choose the Commonwealth as the home for their business. I also wanna highlight a great company announcement from this week. On Tuesday, Vista Metals announced plans to locate a new specialty aluminum products operation in Bowling Green, creating 50 good paying jobs with an approximate $60 million investment. Vista is a market leader in manufacturing of specialty aluminum products, primarily supporting aerospace, which is our number one export, commercial aircraft, defense, automotive, and general industrial applications. This project shows the growth of Kentucky's metals sector and uh, that it's not slowing down anytime soon. We've seen incredible investments across this industry in recent years, and Warren County has been among the leading communities for growth. So thank you to the leaders at Vista Metals for this commitment to Kentucky. I look forward to watching your business grow. Today, we also have some exciting announcements from the state grant, and that's an acronym, G-R-A-N-T program. This program provides matching state funds for projects that will also receive federal funding with things like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and others, many of them requiring a local match. Uh, this was a, a product of the General Assembly to help meet those needs. Many federal funding programs include that cost sharing from it could be local governments, public agencies, or nonprofits. Grant program funding allows applicants to meet those cost share requirements in full. That means our local governments, public agencies, and nonprofits don't have to break, break the bank in order to qualify for that next amazing opportunity to help more people, uh, to do more, and to move forward. 
Last year, the General Assembly appropriated $2 million to get the program up and running, as well as to fund select projects. The uh, program is administered currently by our Department of Local Government, who got these awards out today. Today, I get to announce our selected projects, and we are joined by a few guests. First up, we have some great news for West Kentucky Community and Technical College. They've been selected for nearly $59,000 in matching funds for a grant from the Federal Department of Agriculture. These dollars will help install security equipment in the public clinic, clinic student salon. This salon trains students in the field of cosmetology. And today, we got one of our best presidents, Dr. Anton Reese, president of WKCTC. Dr. Reese, if you would join us and accept these matching funds. Appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Robert. Let's Appreciate step that. just over here so we can get it. All right. You want to join us, Representative? Come on up. We all love a check presentation. <laughs> you want to mention the words? Yes, Representative, you. you want to share after? Thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Governor, Representative Heath. Uh, certainly, I bring uh, greetings uh, with excitement receiving this incredible award on behalf of the uh, WKCTC family. Uh, quick true stat, uh, there are a thousand community and technical colleges across the nation. Uh, we continue to be ranked in the top uh, five uh, on five occasions, so we, we, we take great pride in that. This grant allows us to do the important work of expanding our cosmetology program. Uh, we, uh, each semester, we have about 20 to 40 students on a wait list, uh, so this expansion increases uh, the number of cosmetology students that we can get. Uh, as you know, cosmetology, contrary to popular belief, does more than just here, right? They do uh, everything from aromatherapies, they work with assisted living, right, et cetera, a broad plethora. And as importantly, there's an entrepreneurial aspect uh, that these young men and women who tend to uh, be in those careers also become entrepreneurs, giving back uh, to the robust growth in the Western region. So again, uh, Governor, thank you so much thank you. Uh, for this uh, generous gift. And certainly representative Heath. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's a, it's a good day for Kentucky and for West Kentucky, as he just mentioned. Uh, this is a result of a, a bill that actually started about a year and a half ago, uh, became known as House Bill 9 that was passed through the uh, 2023 General Assembly. And um, this is just the first of many more grants to come that will be transformational to the state of Kentucky. And we're looking forward to see what's next. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. So, speaking of more grants, next we have some good news for the McCracken and Paducah McCracken County Riverport Authority. We selected them for $160,000 to match a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. These funds will help replace critical infrastructure at the port. This will ensure the availability of bulk cargo shipment services for years to come. So today we're joined by Inez Rivas, Rivas Hutchins, uh, who is the chair of the Paducah McCracken County Riverport Board. President, if you'd join us. Here's 160 grand. All right, you wanna brag on your pride? Absolutely, thank you, good afternoon. We'd like to thank the governor and the legislature for great creating this grant program. We would also like to thank Aaron Jones with DLG and all of the staff for all the, their assistance during the application and award process. Our PIDP project will have significant impact within the 14 Western Kentucky counties in adjoining states, which the Riverport services by ensuring a safe, economical and eco-friendly transportation mode for US shippers of bulk commodities to support local and regional agriculture, manufacturing, and infrastructure projects. Our project will also support major infrastructure projects that are currently underway by the Army Corps of Engineers, along with federal, state, and local highway projects. Our PIDP grant is a multi-year project consisting of replacing six critical infrastructure components dating from 1966, along with additional 10 new equipment, upgraded components, that to expand the port's bulk commodity service capabilities and increase the efficiencies within the existing 20-acre bulk commodity transshipment facility. Our PADP grant is an excellent example of a betterment project that came to fruition via public and private partnerships, 
Now with the support of the Kentucky Grant Award, we have federal, state, county, and city entities working together with the port and our business partners to ensure that the next generation of Kentuckians will have access to efficient and economical bulk commodity transshipment services for products and services that directly support our transportation projects and employment opportunities in our region. So on behalf of the Paducah McCracken River Port Authority Board of Directors, our executive director, Team Cahill, who couldn't be here today, our entire team, our owners, the city of Paducah and the McCracken County, along with our business partners and an entire Western Kentucky citizens, we sincerely appreciate the government program grant funds. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. Do I take this one? Just don't take my notes. <laughs> That'd be interesting one day. Uh, our final presentation today is for the Hickman Fulton County Riverport Authority. Last year, they were awarded $3.3 million uh, and a grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation. I wrote a letter of support for that project. Kentucky is sending them nearly $324,000 to help them replace and upgrade their aging conveyor system. This equipment is crucial to the port, which sits in one of the Midwest's major grain producing areas. So today we've got Greg Curlin, Executive Director of the Riverport Authority. Get about all right so you want to brag about your project we're on a 10 acre area where we are mostly agriculture everything that comes in and out of the report mostly is agriculture our small port in west kentucky does about 1.2 million tons per year for for so for a small port it's pretty large um this particular project the conveyor project um is replacing a, a conveyor that was put in in 1978, 40 years old, and we continue to keep maintaining it. That's the biggest thing. We needed some type of opportunity to replace it. Uh, we want to go larger. I've seen trucks lined up for one, two miles uh, trying to get into the granaries because we just cannot keep up with the increase in growth in agriculture in our area. We service Hickman County, Fulton County, Graves County, Callaway County, uh, Ovine County in Tennessee, Weekly County, Tennessee, all everything's going out on the Mississippi River as far as agriculture and grain. So this particular grant will help us do um, increase our uh, opportunities by about 60 percent. And what we're looking for is to be uh, more driven to grow our agriculture in western Kentucky. Thank you all, and I appreciate it. All right. 1978 would make that conveyor system 45 to 46 years old. Uh, I know because I was installed in 1977. <laughs> so uh, we're also announcing matching funds for projects to purchase new diagnostic equipment for Appalachian Regional Healthcare, to improve water pressure in the city of Jackson, and to help create a new STEAM Academy for the Paintsville Independent Schools. And Superintendent Gibson happens to be in town today from Paintsville. We're proposing $300,000 to match an Appalachian Regional Commission grant that is still pending for federal approval. But Superintendent, do we have you? Do you wanna come talk about the project real quick? Come on. You know I'm gonna ask an educator to get up here. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. I uh, appreciate it. I want to give a special thanks to Governor Bashir for supporting our project, the General Assembly, uh, and the community of Paintsville, and uh, my Paintsville Board of Education. This project is near and dear to my heart because uh, I'm a lifelong Appalachian uh, coal miner's son. And uh, we believe in the mountains that we're going to, if we're going to rise up and get better, we're going to do it ourselves. So this program is an economic development center that is K through 12. It's a grassroots movement that will move our region forward. Paintsville is geographically centered right on the 23 corridor. And I'm glad Kobe Hall was here today. SOAR is a very active partner with us and will have a footprint in our building. Uh, we hope to use our facility for adult entrepreneurial training and to uh, be a uh, magnet for jobs to come into our region and to also help our kids at Paintsville. So thank you, Governor. Thank you. Uh, we already received some funding from you, Governor, so we'll be back. All right, good to see you. 
uh, we are confident that that will be approved and we're hoping either this budget or with a lot of work the next budget session we can change that k through 12 to pre-k through 12. we've also selected two more projects both of which are pending federal approval uh, approval of federal funding. Those would help the Penny Ryle Area Development District better respond to natural disasters and help Partnership Housing in Boonville renovate their office and a food distribution center. In total, we've selected eight projects to receive matching funds from the grant program. Uh, I'd now invite um, uh, y'all up if you want to join us. It's a pretty special recap. As we approach the end of Women's History Month, it's important that we recognize the incredible contributions and leadership of Kentucky women year round. Earlier today, Brittany and Karen Lamberton, wife of our Adjutant General Lamberton, who's on her way up, uh, met with the National Guard Service women and veterans, a few of which are with me here today for their Women's History Month event. They visited our stories, our service exhibit at the Kentucky History Center. This exhibit opened last year and it honors our women veterans. Women have proudly served this country for generations, but they have not received the recognition that they deserve. This exhibit is a step forward in ensuring their stories, all these important stories are heard and that the service is recognized. Today, there are more than 1200 women serving in the Kentucky Army Guard. Our state has produced brave women who who shattered barriers in the armed forces. From Anna Mack Clark, the first black woman in Kentucky to enlist in the military during World War II. She's honored by the Veterans of Foreign Wars mural down the street in Frankfurt. To Leanne Hester, a Kentucky Army National Guard soldier who was awarded the Silver Star for her heroic actions during an enemy ambush. Military service women have not only defended our nation, but also excelled at leadership roles, such as our own Colonel Pam Stevenson. We will continue to push to have these important stories of our service women told here in Kentucky. And I'm so glad uh, that Brittany had the chance to meet with some of these amazing women today. And I just want to take a moment for us to stop and to say thank you to each and every one of you. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Tomorrow is also going to be an exciting day here at the Capitol for Women's History Month. The Kentucky Commission on Women will be hosting their Women's History Month event. Your Lieutenant Governor Jacqueline Coleman, Chair of the Commission Marita Willis, and so many others have been working hard to prepare for this event, and it's been a long time coming. Tomorrow, we'll induct seven new women into the Kentucky Women Remembered Exhibit. That is an exhibit inside our state capitol that honors influential women throughout our Commonwealth's history. Now, it has been since 2014, 10 years since we have inducted new women into this exhibit. So tomorrow is a special day. As you know, we previously announced who they are, but tomorrow their portraits, which will then hang here in the capitol along with the others, will be unveiled. Uh, the, the portraits being unveiled tomorrow include humanitarian Parkinson's research advocate and partner to Muhammad Ali and a good friend of mine, Lonnie Ali, founder of Horses and Hope and Shop and Share, ambassador, former first lady, Jane Bashir, advocate on behalf of survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual violence, Sharon Kearns, activist and author, Hannah Drake, a Louisville community leader, Mary Margaret Mulvihill, and the first a uh, woman federal judge appointed in Kentucky, uh, Peggy Patterson, and author and social activist, Bell Hooks. We will be celebrating the incredible legacies of their women, some with their families uh, here uh, for them, as well as the artists of each of their portraits. We're also going to hear from former Poet Laureate Crystal Wilkinson, such a an, an talented artist, as part of the events. It'll be a day to remember as we wrap up Women's History Month and celebrate the strength of Kentucky's women, past and present. Next up, we have some important news uh, from the Justice and, and Public Safety Cabinet. If you three want to join us, we have uh, some announcements uh, about some major positions of leadership. I'm announcing today that I'm appointing um, acting Cabinet Secretary Keith Jackson as permanent Secretary of the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet. We're announcing that Mona Womack 
will serve as the deputy secretary and that Randy White will come in as our new commissioner of the Department of Juvenile Justice. This team has been serving the Commonwealth for numerous years in Veterans Affairs, Fire and Emergency Services, the Cabinet for Health and Family Services, and the Department of Corrections. They have been with my administration since the beginning of my first term, and they are true public servants who want the very best for this Commonwealth. Since August of 2021, Keith Jackson has served as the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet's Deputy Secretary. Prior to joining the Cabinet, Secretary Jackson served as the Commissioner of the Kentucky Department of Veterans Affairs. In June 2012, he made history by becoming the first African-American appointed Chief of the Lexington Division of Fire and Emergency Services. Secretary Jackson is a veteran of the U.S. Army Reserves, where he served for 27 years in numerous capacities every leadership position we have asked him to step in. He has done an incredible job and he's gotten results. Prior to being appointed Deputy Secretary, Mona Womack served as the Cabinet's Chief of Staff. Before that, she served as Executive Advisor to the Public Protection Cabinet, Acting Commissioner of the Department of Housing, Building and Construction, and Acting Executive Director of the Office Claims and Appeals. You've done a lot. Uh, she also served for 26 years at the Cabinet for Health and Family Services as an attorney division director and deputy general counsel. She is a great administrator and leader who knows how to get things done. We've seen it firsthand. In December, 2023, Randy White retired from the Department of Corrections after 27 years of service. During his career, he served in numerous leadership positions from warden to deputy, uh, to, from warden to deputy commissioner of all of our adult institutions. His first day as commissioner of DJJ will be April 1st, then I know he will hit the ground running. Starting in December 2022, we began to implement several steps to address the challenges, especially in our juvenile detention facilities. And Randy White's appointment is the next step in making our juvenile justice system the best that it can be. When I met with Randy, I was struck not just by his background on, on the physical uh, security, which is necessary, and is something that you have to have that safety before you reach everything else but his commitment to the services, to the level of programming that he had been involved in inside of corrections, especially for the youngest individuals coming into corrections. I think with Randy, what we see is the best combination of the knowledge that we need to operate these facilities safely to make the changes we need to make, but also a deep commitment uh, to these juveniles to trying to help them to, to try to get the services needed to reintegrate them with society. And if we do it right, to not see them in one of these detention facilities again. Uh, so if I can, I'm gonna turn it over quickly to Randy White. So there you are. Thank you and Governor Bashir, thank you for leading the charge this past year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your administration has made exceptional and positive changes to the juvenile justice system, all of which I agree with and support in changes that are leading the nation. Thank you. Kentucky is not the only state that has faced juvenile challenges lately, but Kentucky is the only state that has taken aggressive action. Action that is protecting our staff and juveniles, action that is making a difference in the lives of those juveniles in our custody. In December 23, 2023, I retired from the Department of Corrections after 27 years of service. During my career with the department, I had the privilege of serving in numerous leadership positions, such as Deputy Commissioner of Adult Institutions, Warden of the Kentucky State Penitentiary, Warden of the Green River Correctional Complex, and Deputy Warden at the Luther Luckett Correctional Complex, supervising both programs and security during my time there. I also served as a classification and treatment officer, corrections unit administrator, and a correctional officer and a accreditation and procedure specialist. When I retired, I was deputy warden, I'm sorry, deputy commissioner and deputy commissioner of adult institutions. I was responsible for all management uh, aspects of adult institutions and the success of every inmate and every staff member. Those inside and outside of prison who are working to provide secure custody security that is critical to keeping our community safe and vital to the real rehabilitation of our justice involved population before they're released and they return home. During my tenure at Corrections, I'm proud 
of a lot of things that we accomplished, but two that have meant the most to me are assisting uh, with Kentucky securing the lowest recidivism rate in its history and developing an Narcan program to train staff on how to administer Narcan, uh, saving lives uh, to prevent drug overdoses. I think we're the first prison system in the nation to implement this program. There may have been others that followed us, but we're the first. All of this to say that after 27 years of serving in corrections and having interaction with juveniles as they were transferred from detention to prisons, I can honestly say that juveniles enter in the criminal justice system. Uh, they're a much different population than they were 27 years ago. They're committing harsher crimes, which require stronger rehabilitative programs. For Kentucky to truly reduce the juvenile population, we must focus our efforts on alternatives to detention education programming, employment, and mental health. Our juveniles need our support, and I pledge to do just that by prioritizing our efforts on reducing youth crime and recidivism, increasing mental health treatment, enhancing employee training, and securing all 27 juvenile facilities to better protect youth and our staff, while continuing to implement the administration's aggressive plans to enhance safety and response to violence incidents. I look forward to hitting the ground running April 1st. Thank you, Governor Bashir, Secretary Jackson, and Deputy Secretary Womack for this opportunity. And to all the staff at the Department of Juvenile Justice, I look forward to working with you. I look forward to working with you and making the department a leader in juvenile justice. Together, I know we will do good things for our youth and for the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Secretary Jackson, Deputy Secretary uh, Womack. As you can see, we went through a process. We didn't want to rush it. And my goal was to get a leader uh, who understood uh, both the security needs of our facilities, but also had a deep commitment to the programming. I believe in the weeks and the months and the years to come, you'll see that we made the right pick, and that's exactly uh, who our new commissioner is. All right, this past week, we've also seen some major progress on our work to support Kentuckians battling addiction. On Tuesday, I was able to cut the ribbon for three addiction treatment centers in Eastern Kentucky. First, I was able to celebrate the grand opening of Addiction Recovery Care's Belfont Hospital and Recovery Center Psychiatric Unit. It was here that we learned about a great report from East Tennessee State University that shows our Commonwealth is leading the nation on residential drug and alcohol beds. We are number one per capita in the country, and it's not even close on treatment beds for our people. Folks, this is just further proof that our hard work is paying off. Next, I attended the grand opening of the Journey Recovery Housing. The Journey offers 25 beds for women recovering from addiction, as well as a room for their young children as well. This facility will support these women with independent living, employment, and wraparound services to help them get back on their feet. Almost a year ago today in a Team Kentucky update, we highlighted Kentucky's recovery housing program. These programs provide fund, uh, this program provides funding to organizations across the state to shelter Kentuckians and get them back on their feet, help them to get into recovery, and help them to stabilize their life and ultimately reunite with their families. The program is administered by our Department for Local Government, and the Journey used a $925,000 grant to help make this facility a reality. The journey is managed by Pathways, an amazing nonprofit helping Kentuckians on the road to recovery. We have a message from Pathways CEO, Jennifer Willis. Good afternoon. I would like to thank the governor for being a part of our ribbon cutting and grand opening of the journey, a women's recovery center. This project was made possible through the recovery housing project and the community development block grant dollars that support it. This is the first center in Kentucky to open as part of the Recovery Housing Project, and we are very proud of that. We are eager to put our, our grant dollars to use by serving women who are pregnant, women newly postpartum with their babies, or any woman suffering from substance use disorder. We appreciate the collaboration 
the work of the state, and all that we're involved in making this possible. This was the first project completed from the Recovery Housing Program, and many more are to come. At the end of the day, we also celebrated the grand opening for the Pathways Residential Crisis Stabilization Unit. Now, my faith teaches me that second chances aren't just the right thing to do. They're what we are called to do, that we are our brother and sister's keeper, even if our brother or sister have fallen on hard times. Uh, these folks, Pathways, uh, Addiction, Recovery, Care, are living out our collective faith and values, and they're helping our people. And at a time when we are announcing more jobs than ever, look at what we just announced today. Second chance employment, again, isn't just the right thing to do. It's absolutely necessary to meet our workforce needs. So let's keep working together. We are seeing real progress, national recognition, and that's the work of thousands of people across the Commonwealth that have been doing this for over a decade. Keep it up. You're saving lives. A severe weather update. Um, we declared a state of emergency last Friday after severe storms swept through the Commonwealth that Thursday. The storms produced an EF2 tornado, heavy rain, very large hail, and strong winds that damaged private properties and public infrastructure and disrupted utilities, both power and water. The areas with the highest impact were Trimble, Carroll, and Gallatin counties. We had significant damage to a number of structures and the hardest hit area was the town of Milton in Trimble County where a tornado was confirmed. On Saturday, I visited Milton to see the damage myself, to visit the families that are affected and to promise that we will work together uh, to dig out and to rebuild. Uh, the key update on this is first, let's remember, we didn't lose anybody. We had zero fatalities and when you see this tornado and the videos of it. This is an amazing act of God. We had two injuries. They were pretty minor. One required stitches, but otherwise everybody was okay physically. Uh, sheltering, we currently have 10 households uh, at General Butler State Park with 26 individuals. We've had 27 households that we sheltered for a little bit that have transitioned out. Uh, KYEM is working with survivors to identify alternative housing as we speak. On damage assessments, all FEMA joint uh, pub, uh, PDA assessments for individual assistance were completed yesterday. KYEM will request individual assistance and household assistance from FEMA. Um, and we now are down to zero power outages in any of the impacted counties. Survivors can call the Red Cross at 1-800-RED-CROSS for assistance. We also activated the state's price gouging laws to protect Kentuckians from overpriced goods and services. Remember, that's not just gas. That's what we think of. It's also cleaning services. It's building supplies. Kentuckians can report and should report price gouging to the Office of Attorney General. After every natural disaster, we will stand with our people. But I got to mention one thing. For the first time in our state's history, the current version of the budget that's being negotiated between the House and the Senate has a hard cap limit on what we're allowed to do in responding to natural disasters, a limit of $25 million for a fiscal year. Let me tell you this, if that limit had been in place, we wouldn't have been able to open up General Butler State Park. We would not have been able to help out the people that were impacted because we were already over that amount in this fiscal year. What it means is we'd have a tornado, our people uh, would desperately need help and either we'd have to run a bill through the General Assembly or I'd have to call the legislature into special session just to ask them, can I please help our people after a natural disaster? This is wrong. It is, it is going to prevent us from responding uh, the way we need to. And we're asking everyone out there, reach out to your senator and your representative and ensure this limitation is not in the final budget. As another example, which is just one of the craziest ones, there is a $4 million limit to fighting wildfires. I guess at that point, either we have to call a special session and say, can we continue to fight wildfires or we let parts of Kentucky burn? I mean, that is ridiculous. Of course, we have to continue to fight wildfires. So again, this is something that has never been in a budget before with good reason. And we need everybody's help calling their legislators to make sure it's not in the final budget. Finally, Team Kentucky All-Stars. Today marks the start of arguably the greatest time in sports, the kickoff to the NCAA basketball tournament 
unless you include the play-in games, in which case it's been going on a day or two. Kentucky has four great schools playing in the tournament this year. Representing the men's side, we have the University of Kentucky, Western Kentucky University, and Rocky would never let me forget, Moorhead State University. On the women's side, the University of Louisville is the lone representative in this year's tournament. While we are excited for all these teams uh, that have a chance to compete for the national championship today, we're celebrating another great school that is already a national champion. Come on in. In just their second season, you can come on up. Yeah, let's celebrate you. In just their second season, Simmons College of Kentucky's women's basketball program won the NCCAA Division II National Championship. This is the first national championship in the institution's history. Uh, the team is led by first-year head coach Earl Ruffin. My goodness, that's going to set quite uh, expectations for future seasons. Uh, who went on to win the championship, led by 30 points from Scott County's own Morgan DeFore. Where are you, Morgan? <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. 30 points yes, sir. in a national championship game. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you. Um, uh, is it Naria Reed? Naria. Naria. Yeah. First team for the tournament. Congratulations. And Zephania? Zephania? Apologies. Zeph, Zeph, uh, uh, Zeph Gray, they were named first team all region. And Andrea, where do we have? Andrea, you were named second team all regions. Simmons College is one of Kentucky's great HBCUs, and this team has just etched their name in history. So congratulations to this team. Congratulations to Simmons College of Kentucky, to President Dr. Kevin L. Cosby, to the Lady Falcons, to head coach uh, as well as assistant coach Angel Thomas. Coach, why don't you come up and say a few words for your team to the Commonwealth? I'm gonna stand up here for you. How you guys doing today? Uh, we, we just want to thank you guys for inviting us down. We are greatly and truly blessed to be down here to see you guys. We just want you guys to keep an eye on us while we just getting started and the best is yet to come. All right. Thank you all very much. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Enjoy the rest of your Thank day you. at the Capitol. Try to talk some sense to everybody if you can. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you all. I'm about to answer questions from the press. You don't want to be anywhere close to this now. <laughs> there you go. All right. I'll take nice to meet y'all too. 30 points. All right. We will now open it up for questions. I think this is the most people we have ever had at a Team Kentucky update, thinking these came out of updates from the pandemic when we had absolutely no one. Uh, so let's start with uh, who we have in person. We'll start with uh, Sarah from Bluegrass Live. Yeah. Well, today we saw a lot of people playing politics. We saw um, a representative push a resolution claiming that we were an EPA sanctuary state and then admitted that if we followed through on it, the EPA would come and take over regulation in Kentucky. So it's saying, I don't like this big, bad group in the federal government, so I'm going to do something that gives them control of, of, of our regulations in the state. It's silly. Uh, hopefully it doesn't move any further, because if you truly uh, believe that the EPA is not doing the right thing, you definitely want our energy and environment cabinet leading the way. Uh, I think the, the energy uh, commission that's out there is being opposed by just about all of our utilities. Um, it's going to take um, uh, authority that right now you can go to the Public Service Commission uh, for very public hearings and, and an opportunity to be heard and, and move it to potentially a very small group that's not necessarily representative of, of all of our energy sector. Now, listen, I've been vocal that um, we, we have to have enough means of production for all these announcements we're making. And I've been critical of the federal government about trying to shut down means of production during this period 
I'm not talking about what we decide to build new, but I'm saying at a time when we have this much energy need, we have to be very careful. The math uh, has to work. So I, I've, I've been in just about the same place as some of the people who are talking about this commission, but this commission is not uh, the way to do it. Uh, Carolina, WLEX. Yeah. Uh, the Safer Kentucky Act is a really big piece of legislation. In at least one of the versions, um, it has a portion that I like very much that would stop selling weapons that have murdered people off to the highest bidder. There has been a provision in at least one of the versions that would stop that practice, which would if if, if a federal agency hadn't stepped in would have auctioned off the gun that killed my friend just about a year uh, ago. Uh, so I have seen that provision uh, and I hope in some way, form or fashion that that becomes uh, law at some point. Uh, certainly one of the most concerning pieces uh, in it is is some of the provisions about homelessness. And I believe that there were some, some good potential amendments that were considered, uh, but not ultimately uh, put into the text of the bill. So it, it's, it's hard to comment on a bill that tries to do this many things. I think it properly it should have been split in, into different bills so that each of those areas could be discussed. Yeah. yeah. You bet on the Pats to, to win. Are you sticking with that or do you think one of Kentucky's other teams <laughs> actually have a better team? Well, the question is on... Uh, 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 rooting for or, or betting on or predicting UK or one of our other teams to, to to win the national title. When you're governor, you have two jobs to root for your in-state schools and to root against Duke. So I will be rooting for each of our Kentucky schools. I will be rooting against the Blue Devils. And certainly on the women's side, it's U L all the way. Um, they are our only uh, women's team in, but they are a great team uh, led by a great coach that play great basketball. Uh, Tessa from the Herald Leader. Mm -hmm. We just gave out. Um, that would move that to the Department of Agriculture, uh, also seeing a bill advanced by the Fish and Wildlife Department of Agriculture. Do you have reaction to these bills, and, and yeah. uh, why do you think that's being done? Well, the legislature is playing uh, petty partisan games and trying to move uh, different uh, groups or governance that has always been under the governor to a different constitutional officer just because I'm a Democrat and they're a Republican. That is bad government, and it's going to produce bad results. Moving this big grant program for the, from the Department of Local Government to agriculture means it won't work. Uh, DLG, where it is now under the governor's office, regularly gives out grants. They have the process and the training. Ag doesn't give out these types of grants. Moreover, these are matching grants to things like ARC grants, which go through the Department of Local Government like Delta Regional Authority grants that go through the Department of Local Government, sometimes CDBG grants, which go through the Department of Local Government. Uh, the Department of Local Government is who the federal government works directly with. And if you want to match federal grants where it should be, it's going to create multiple uh, processes, so much extra work, and moving something that's so important at a time right after the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure laws in place, and we need to be competitive now, is a mistake. And ultimately, the Supreme Court is going to need to step in at some point. If the legislature can move any power, any direction, not only can they play partisan games and switch almost who is the governor uh, each and, and, and every year, but they can play power games where an executive that may be standing up for the executive branch and things it's supposed to do in contradiction to the General Assembly could be punished and have just about anything moved out from under them. So if you're gonna have three equal branches of government, which is what our separation of powers is supposed to be about, you can't just be able to, to, to move all these things uh, for any reason or no reason at all. Uh, Tom, Kentucky Today. Thank you, Governor. Um, i asked about the, the, your announcement today. Uh, first it's of pretty all, great. Yes, first of all, what does that project actually do? I, 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 I can't get a real big yeah. handle on that. And secondly, how long will it take before it's ready to start 
doing whatever it does. So I'm told the construction on the Bell County project is going to be about five years in the beginning. And so if you think about those 1,500 jobs and, and how they'll crest, it's, it's really uh, incredible. What it does is power storage. If you think about some of our problems with power generation, it's that, it's that we, we have to generate as much as needed on the, on the biggest in-demand moments. But if it's not used, we can't really store it or we can't store it well. And that's what this project uh, attempts to do. I mean, the, the reliability of our grid, um, how much production we would need, if we could save what's produced, say, at low usage times and then use them during high usage times, uh, that, that would mean that we wouldn't have a problem during weather events. It could likely bring down the cost of, of electricity because it costs so much more at the, the high times than, than at the low. Uh, and, and it's one of the major things that our government um, and, and the industry is working at. It, it's batteries have been another uh, means in talking about that. But, but with this storage and, and its ability, and admittedly, I don't know how it works uh, uh, scientifically, um, but, it, but it's also go going to be able to provide hours of additional power at times when everything else could potentially go down. Yes. So you're storing water. This is this is uh, using water between uh, two pools uh, to to ultimately store uh, electricity, um, and it's doing it on an abandoned coal mine. The great thing about this is if we can prove that it works, and the federal government believes it works, it's putting eighty something million dollars in. They're investing one point three billion dollars in. We have a lot of sites like this that could be a part of a clean energy future uh, on top of an abandoned coal mine. Liam. I wanted to reference back to the, the House bill resolution that passed out committee uh, today. It broadly says that there's you know regulatory um, overreach by the federal government the US EPA. And there are a number of um, regulations, proposals that are coming down the pipe that would make significant changes in the energy sector and vehicles. You know, one would require new vehicles, the majority of new vehicles by 2032 to, um, you know, be electric based off of, you know, the curbing of greenhouse mm -hmm. gas emissions from vehicles. Another would um, require coal plants and new natural gas plants to, um, you know, capture emissions, which mm -hmm. uh, critics of the rule, you know, say could, um, you know, see coal retirement, shut down the coal sector. In light of um, how this joint resolution is characterized regarding regulatory overreach, what, what's your view on some of these <laughs> Oh, yeah, if if, if if the if the if the joint resolution is about overreach by the EPA, why would you do something that puts the EPA in charge? I it, when any time that I look at a plan or a bill, my first question is, will it work? And this does the exact opposite of what it's saying. Uh, I think the EPA, first of all, it's putting out a whole lot all at the same time. And second, I believe in a lot of them, um, while the intent, I believe, is is right, the timing is often very aggressive. But what we're seeing is the EPA will put it out and then it'll delay it a little bit or it will work with certain communities. Um, we're going to have a couple counties that are non-attainment that, that the administrators already offered uh, to work with. And so you have a real advantage when you have an energy and environment cabinet that can reach out to an EPA because we're the regulator and say, can you work with us on this part and this part and on the overall timing? Now, if this resolution went through if we did what it what it what it says and the EPA came in and took over, we wouldn't get those allowances. All right. The, the rules and the regulations would be stricter here uh, than what they are under energy and, and environment. So but I, but the schedules of what's being put out right now, but then oftentimes delayed, I do think are really aggressive and really challenging to to meet. Uh, Karen Zar on virtual. Good afternoon, Governor. I have two. Uh, the first is, it's very rare that we get to see you and Senate President Stiver standing side by side up at the podium. Can you talk about the working behind the scenes across party lines to be able to make today's announcement? And then also, this is going to be the first NCAA tournament since we uh, had expanded gaming here in Kentucky. Do you have back. any projections on what this is going to mean to the economy? Thank you. I'll start with the second one. This is the first NCAA tournament where you can legally bet. Uh, and it's good that we have it because we are learning um, how much people were betting 
not through a legal uh, regulated system. Uh, right now, the, our, our sports betting is, is smashing every projection that was out there. So I don't have one today uh, about what we think it will bring in. And just about every year does a little bit more. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting down in the data because I believe um, we're, we're seeing uh, a broad base when you look at the number of, of different individuals, which is what you want to see if there's a lot of betting, that it's across a lot of people so that nobody is betting uh, too much. Um, what I hope is that everybody does it responsibly but enjoys it, and I guess it gives you the reason to watch uh, that 5-12 matchup, which is often where that upset occurs, uh, even if you don't have a connection to that school. Um, standing up next to President Stivers, we've worked on a lot together uh, from the uh, uh, special the special session uh, that got the Ford SK incentives that led to the largest investment in state history to the uh, ability from that piece of legislation to get AESC's second biggest investment in state history. And a lot of work is done behind the scenes. You know, you can't let a couple, well, more than a couple, but public uh, uh, disagreements get in the way of working together the next day. Our job is to show up every day to try to do the best we can and to work together uh, where we can. So appreciate his and everybody's help in making this project happen. And finally, we have Aaron Kelly uh, back with us on uh, virtually, who's now stationed up in D.C., Thank you, Governor. Um, and speaking of, I know you were at the White House with Vice President Harris last week for a discussion on marijuana reform. Uh, in 2022, you encouraged. <laughs> yes, and in 2022, you encouraged people who only had simple marijuana possession convictions on their records to apply for a pardon. Can you share an update on that? Have you pardoned anyone? How is this going? I have, but it's been a small number. I think it may only even be a couple because they're misdemeanors. And so people can go in, simple possession in Kentucky is a misdemeanor, and you can get it expunged. So if I pardon something, somebody can't hold it against you. You, you haven't lost any rights if it's a misdemeanor, but it's still on your record. If you expunge it, it's gone. And so what we've really tried to direct people to is expungement and, and to the clinics out there on expungement. Um, many more of our pardons, for instance, the, the restoration of voting rights um, applied to a little over five thousand uh, marijuana related uh, uh, convictions. Now, those could be lower level trafficking or others where somebody has served their time and turned their life around. And then most of the other pardons, I think I've, I've, I've done about 50, um, just under 50 uh, other pardons. Almost all of them are drug related crimes that, that were felonies, but people that have definitely turned their life around. And most of the time, are helping other people that are going through it or out there starting businesses or have earned the right to be able to go on their kids field trips where if you have a felony even if it's 10 plus years ago you might not be able to do uh, so it was a, a good conversation with i never thought i'd be in a room with the vice president and fat joe at the same time uh, but but also three individuals talking about their own life and especially what felony marijuana possession uh, did to to so many uh, of their lives uh, something that um, yes while illegal under federal law the the punishment uh, for and how long it stayed on so many records you know just uh, isn't right and and wasn't right uh, so we're going to continue uh, to try to do the right thing here to try to provide those second chances this was a big day fifteen hundred and thirty new jobs coming to Bell County and the surrounding region biggest economic development announcement in Eastern Kentucky. And stay tuned. I think next week we're going to have a real big week too. Thank you all.